Sue for uh, the introduction, and um, I'm very thrilled to represent uh, Class 4. So um, I thought I'd start with a little bit of background, because I think mine is very unusual. Um, I was born in East Chicago, Indiana. My parents were immigrants from Mexico. Um, my father worked in the steel mills. Neither of them had much of an education, but they always thought that education was important and always pushed the kids to, to learn. So I fell in love with science when I was in high school. My favorite classes were science, math, biology, math, and chemistry. Um, and so when I started college, I assumed I would be a science teacher because I didn't know what other careers there were for, for scientists. But um, my um, third year, um, I decided to do an honors thesis project. And Terry Schultz here is the individual who helped me with my thesis. And he introduced me to um, the Oak Ridge National Labs, where I spent a, um, a summer doing research. And that first summer, I was just hooked. I knew I had to do research. Um, the next summer, I spent at the NIH, where uh, Gabriel Vogeli was um, my mentor. And, and he actually helped me. He, he, taught me how to, he taught me molecular biology. It was a very exciting time to be at the NIH. Um, at the NIH, I met uh, Peter Mueller. Peter was at the Max Planck Institute in Germany, and he invited me to come to the Max Planck and to be a technician for however long I wanted. Um, and so it was just a wonderful opportunity for me. It was my first time traveling to Europe, um, and it was at the same time I was doing science. Um, and Peter is the one that really pushed me to go to graduate school and get a PhD. After graduate school, I did my um, postdoctoral studies with Arnie Levine, and he discovered the gene that I'll be talking to you about today called P53. And then uh, in the P53 field, there are two wonderful uh, women, uh, Carol Privis and Varda Rotter, who've just been terrific mentors for me throughout my career. So now to the science. Um, I'm going to talk about um, how cells prevent, um, how, how, how this gene, P53, prevents a cell from becoming a cancer. So um, the first slide I'm going to show you is one that we call the Manhattan Plot. And along this axis are 36 different kinds of cancers. Along this axis are 125 genes that are mutated in many cancers. And you can see some um, peaks and some valleys. The peak that I hope you're noticing is this peak right here. Uh, almost every one of these cancers has a mutation or alteration of the P53 gene. It is the most altered gene in, in cancer. So how does P53 work? Whoops, I forgot to switch over. So um, P53 is a DNA binding transcription factor. This is a um, the structure of P53 DNA binding domain here on the left and the DNA on the right. And this was done by Nikola Pavlicic, Pavlicic back in 1995. And what you can see here is that there are several amino acids in yellow that are absolutely directly um, binding to this DNA binding domain. And what you'll see in a minute is, is eliminating anyone or, or altering any one of these amino acids will give you a protein that can no longer bind DNA. So um, how do we know that P53 really contributes to uh, tumor phenotypes? This is an analysis of uh, pedigree that my colleague at MD Anderson, Louise Strong, has characterized for a number of years. And this pedigree in particular has six different generations, and these individuals inherit a mutation in P53. So every individual in red is an affected mutation carrier in 2003. And there's some um, fascinating aspects to this pedigree. First of all is an individual that has a P53 mutation will uh, normally get multiple cancers throughout their lives. So this woman here, for example, had five different cancers before she died. The other aspect of this pedigree is that it's all kinds of cancers that these individuals get. So there's um, the sarcomas, the soft tissue sarcomas, the osteosarcomas defined the disease, which is named after Lee, Drs. Lee and Framani, uh, who characterized it. There are, there's ALL, there's lung cancers, there's uh, melanoma, brain breast is a very common um, um, uh, cancer in this, in, in this pedigree. Uh, everybody in pink here 
is an individual who has a p53 mutation, but at the time that Louise, uh, um, in 2003, when Louise was gathering these individuals, they didn't, they didn't have cancer. But what I've done is, um, move forward. In 2012, we, we uh, looked at these individuals again, and what you can clearly see is that these individuals start to get cancer. And they're just at such a high risk. So these pedigrees are very dynamic, um, and these individuals um, know now that they have a p53 mutation, and there's actually some protocols in place now to screen these individuals with whole body MRI on a regular basis to detect those cancers early. So the kinds of mutations that these individuals get are very different from other tumor suppressors. And the kinds of mutations they get are usually these missense mutations. So it's a single amino acid substitution, and it occurs in the DNA binding domain, which is a domain that interacts with DNA to activate transcription. These five amino acids are what we call hotspot mutations because they're mutated over and over and over again. And these are also the um, mutations that on the previous slide were in yellow. Um, and that's because those are the ones that are altered and lead to disruption of the protein function. But, but the other important idea that the field had for uh, a while was that these mutations, even though they lose function, maybe they give the cell a growth advantage. Because in general, tumor suppressors seem to be deleted but here's one in which mutations were very prevalent. So we thought that these mutations contributed to a more aggressive cancer. So uh, in Arnie's lab, I fell in love with a mouse. And um, the reason I fell in love with the mouse is because it has almost all of the genes that, that we have. And P53 is certainly one of them. Those hotspot hot mutations are also present um, well, not the mutations, but those hotspot amino acids are also present in the mouse. And, and the best part to me was even back in 1985, we could manipulate the genome of a mouse to make the kinds of mutations that occur in human cancers. And so uh, one of the first models that we made then was a mouse in which we generated one of these uh, hotspot mutations. So the mutation was 175 in humans. It's 172 in the mouse. It's an arginine to histidine mutation. And uh, this mouse is very tumor prone, just like the leaf romani syndrome patients. Um, and this is just a primary tumor on the left ear, stained with the P53 antibody so that you can see that mutant P53 protein. And then on the right are um, two samples um, that show uh, a very high metastatic capacity. So this primary tumor metastasized very frequently to the liver, uh, here shown, and then here is a small metastasis to the brain, also stained with the p53 antibody. So the major difference between a mouse that had a mutation versus a mouse that didn't have a mutation, had a deletion p53, was a metastatic, metastatic phenotype. So that's shown here. So in green, are uh, the osteosarcomas and the carcinomas that developed in our mice. Uh, the osteosarcomas had a 70% metastatic capacity. Uh, the, the carcinomas were at about 30, 40%. And that's in comparison here to tumors that have no P53. They have a deletion in P53. And while these mice were also tumor prone and developed the same kinds of tumors, um, they did not have a, a high metastatic burden. In the middle here, I show the fibrosarcomas because these mice also developed the fibrosarcomas, but none of these were metastatic. So I think it points to the complexity of the p53 mutation and that just having a p53 mutation doesn't contribute to metastasis in some tissues. Um, this slide I'm using to, to come back now to the human samples because there's a very high correlation between mutations in p53 and aggressive cancers. So the first line up here, I've uh, modeled uh, um, ovarian cancer, high-grade serious ovarian cancer. 98% of these cancers have p53 mutations. It is the earliest event. It happens very early, and this is an incredibly aggressive tumor. The 2 or 3% that don't have p53 mutations are probably misdiagnosed. So p53 mutations definitely drives this um, highly invasive disease. 
in the middle, I've um, modeled colorectal cancers. So colorectal cancers initiate with a RAS mutation, an APC mutation, RAS mutation, and the last mutation is a P53 mutation. But that's when the tumor becomes invasive and aggressive and leaves the colon uh, and metastasizes. And I think there are tumors out there that might that might have a p53 mutation, but it's not a very stable protein. It, it's somewhat indolent, and these uh, tumors don't have that aggressive nature of the p53 missense carriers. So um, the p53 pathway is uh, very, very interesting. And I forgot to show that one slide at the beginning, but it doesn't matter. So p53 um, is a transcription factor. It binds DNA and activates over 100 genes. Um, some of these genes are involved in arresting the cell, preventing the cell from dividing. And what that does is that gives the, the cell a chance to, to fix the DNA, to repair uh, what's wrong. Um, the other group of genes that P53 activates are genes that are involved in apoptosis in cell death. So normally, P53 is kept at very low levels by these two proteins called MDM2 and MDM4. So MDM2 is what we call an E3 ubiquitin ligase, and it binds to P53 and targets P53 for degradation. So basically takes P53 out of the picture. And MDM4 is a facilitator of MDM2. It helps MDM2 to dampen P53 levels. And this is so important in a normal cell because of this potent ability of P53 to, to prevent division or to kill the cell. So you want to keep this, this P53 gene at very low levels. So in, um, in general, a lot of different kinds of stress signals, DNA damage, is what causes phosphorylation of P53 and disruption of this interaction. So then P53 can do what it does, kill the cell or um, stop the cell from proliferating. Um, the kinds of DNA damage, uh, UV light, uh, will inactivate P53. Um, any other kinds of DNA damage, drugs that are often used in the clinic will activate P53. Um, ionizing radiation. So all of these stress signals will, will, um, will um, activate P53 and allow it to do what it's supposed to do in surveilling the cell. So um, I've told you that this is a really important relationship. I want to show you one experiment from my lab that says it's a very important experiment. And again, this is using our mouse models. So because we can manipulate the genome of the mouse, we attempted to make a mouse that had no MDM2, okay? And we couldn't make that mouse, okay? Because not having MDM2 is a very early uh, lethal event. So this is a blastocyst at about 128 state, eight, 120 cell stage, and it's about to implant into the uterus, except it can't implant because every one of those cells is dead by a process called apoptosis. So at the time that we made this mouse, we said, okay, so it's a lethal event. Could it be lethal because we've unleashed the activity of P53, and that P53 then is killing these cells? So what we did is a genetic experiment in which, in which we now have that MDM2 uh, deletion, but on top of that, we took away P53. If we take away P53, we completely rescue that phenotype. We went from an embryo that was dead couldn't implant to a perfectly viable mouse. Of course, this mouse is going to be tumor prone because it doesn't have P53, but the, the experiment basically says how physiologically important this MDM2 protein is at inhibiting P53 activities. So MDM2 in tumors is present at very high levels. I show here uh, two examples of a head and neck squamous carcinomas. On the le left, yes, it's MDM2 uh, stained with an antibody, and every one of those uh, black nuclei has high levels of MDM2. MDM4 falls in that same category. Um, the MDM4 uh, mouse that has no MDM4 is also an embryo lethal, and you can also rescue that phenotype by taking away P53, and that phenotype um, tumors also have very high levels of MDM4. It's kind of interesting that there's a lot of uh, tissue specificity, so retinoblastoma, for example, has very high levels of uh, MDM4. Um, the sarcomas, the osteosarcomas, have very high levels of MDM2. Um, in this experiment, um, 
these um, tumors that have high levels of the p53 inhibitors do not have mutations in p53. So what it suggests is that you can inactivate this pathway by either mutating p53 or overexpressing these inhibitors at high levels. So I'm going to use this slide again to emphasize that different tumors activate p53, inactivate the p53 pathway differently. Uh, the uh, ovarian cancers mutate P53 100% of the time. The liposarcomas overexpress this MDM2 protein almost 100% of the time. And then here on the right, I've shown you a glioblastoma. And glioblastomas are, are um, a very um, aggressive cancers. About a third have P53 mutations. A quarter have high levels of these two inhibitors. And those occur mutually exclusively. So you either get a p53 mutation or you overexpress these um, inhibitors. Uh, but here in gray is about half the glioblastomas for which we don't understand um, how the p53 pathway is being dampened. So I firmly believe that you've got to inactivate p53 for this tumor to evolve, but we don't know. So that's a big black box. My last slide, I just want to show you a new model that we've just developed in the lab because I think we're, we're trying to understand this metastatic ability of mutant P53. So in this model, instead of having P53 present in the entire mouse and getting all kinds of tumors, we've made a P53 mutation only in the osteoblast. And so these mice get osteosarcomas. So here you can see a very large osteosarcoma. Because of the molecular biology tools that we have, we can label these green. So now you can see these green metastases to the lung. Here's a larger uh, picture of that. And then here's a metastases to the liver, a highly metastatic um, uh, system. So now I'm hoping that we can actually study the whole process from the initiation of the primary tumor to establishment of the metastases and to the growth of metastatic cells. So with that, I'll stop and take questions. Thank you for your attention. Questions? Let's see if people are actually getting up here or leaving. Okay, we have. In the case of the missense mutations, um, since P53 can tetramerize, uh, are the oligomers with wild type P53? Uh, if you have different combinations of monomers that are mutant versus yes. wild type, how that's is this a, affecting the pattern of transcription? That is a great question, and we still don't know. So the question really is, so P53, when it binds DNA, it's actually four proteins together that bind DNA. And we don't know if having one normal and three mutant is going to be functional or not, or two and two. Um, what we 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 have in our mouse models some inkling that some of these mutant proteins um, especially the 175 mutation, is so disrupted that it can't interact with the wild type P53. So in those tumors, we tend to always lose the normal P53 gene. So that's an area that we're also Most trying. of the mutations are in the DNA binding domain. Correct, now, so, yeah. correct. But a couple are structurally, structurally defective proteins, and those, I think, can't tetramerize. Yes, you're right. This may be a little bit of a related question, so it's, it, it relates to the difference between null and mutant, and so the, the mutants uh, are unable to bind DNA, but I'm wondering if they have other functions uh, yes. that may be uh, independent of sequence-specific DNA binding, but they can still interact with other transcription factors or, or co-activators or, or co-repressors, uh, and that, that that would be related to this uh, distinct phenotype. Yes, that, that's exactly what happens. And so um, in this model and in other model systems, when the protein becomes very stable, it can interact with other proteins and it disrupts really the, uh, the whole transcriptional program. So um, the mutant proteins can interact with the ETS2 transcription factor, for example. And so what, what happens is you have this very potent transcriptional activation domain of P53 being swept into different promoters and driving a different transcriptional program. In this sarcoma model, and I didn't have time to present, we actually took ETS2 out of the picture, and you get a drastic decrease in that metastatic phenotype. So those are the kinds of experiments that need to be done now. We need to ask on a tissue-specific um, manner 
what, what are those proteins that that mutant P53 is, is, is interacting with to cause this very aggressive phenotype. Okay. Thank you, Gigi. Okay. Thank you.